everybody, and welcome to this episode of Kelly's Quest. We're right now kind of in the middle of a lot of stuff happening in the United States with the trans community, and I'm very fortunate to be able to talk with some people that are not from the Massachusetts area so they can give us per, per, a perspective of what's going on in the state of North Carolina. And I have with me Rel Lowry from uh, Charlotte Black Pride and Bethany Corrigan with Transcend Charlotte. And I really do appreciate you all so much for taking your time to be with me to discuss what's happening in your state and also what's happening in the nation. Sure, first off, thank you for having me. Um, I should say my name is Rel and I'm the Transgender Community Liaison for Charlotte Black Pride. Um, in a nutshell, my position on the board is to make sure that the um, needs of the transgender community are addressed by Charlotte Black Pride so that uh, make sure that all of those things are included um, when we're addressing the rest of the LGBT community and make sure that our transgender brothers and sisters or, um, are not left out of the equation. Specifically in North Carolina and like you said it's pretty much all over right now. Um, myself I, 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 I want to say I'm in shock but at the same time I'm not because of the last four years I think right now it's kind of like okay we're back at this point again what do we do to stop this this ball from rolling down the mountain? Um, our standpoint on it right now is to just make sure that any resources that we can get to our community as far as educating them to let them know if it's, if it's our LGBT community, our allies, we need your voices. We need you to stand up with us. We need you to be in the forefront. Um, it's fine to have the conversations with your LGBT and trans community friends but when you're out in public and you see these things taking place, we need our allies to stand up right now. Um, not behind the walls, not just on social media. We need your voices. We need, we need to see your support. If they see that the entire country, not just the transgender community, is in need and fully supporting us, I think that's what, what is, what is going to be needed. We need those extra voices. We need the support. We need to make sure that that awareness is brought to the front and let them know that it, it doesn't just affect us because if you're a parent and you have a transgender child or you have a niece or a nephew or someone at your school, if you're a teacher, if you have a transgender student, this, affect, this doesn't just affect transgender people, it affects everyone. And especially when you're speaking about this affecting our youth, our youth is our future. So if you're telling them that they're not good enough right now, where does that leave us? So that's probably a little bit more ahead of where we're going, but it, 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 it's affecting, I think, pretty much everyone emotionally right now because every time you turn on the news, it's like, I can't believe this is where we are again. It, it, it really is. And I know way up here in Massachusetts, I, when I moved up here, I thought that I was moving here to feel safe. I thought, oh, I'm coming to a very progressive area of the nation. Everything's going to be okay up here. I get to live my life. And certainly some things are different up here. I do get to have a lot more freedoms as a transgender woman up here, I feel, than I did in Tennessee, especially as an educator. Mm -hmm. But even up here in some of the New England states, there are bills being introduced right now that are anti-trans. And Bethany, the two bills that I know of in North Carolina, and I think you mentioned there might be a third one, really just mind-bogglingly anti-trans. Like, I don't know if I've ever I don't even know how they could be enforced, some of them. So I would like for you to maybe kind of explain what Transcend Charlotte does and how you help the community also. And is there anything that the community, that your organization is doing to help push back against these anti-trans bills? Sure, yeah. So th thank you again for having, having us. Um, <clears throat> so Transcend Charlotte, we are a local nonprofit in, profit in Mecklenburg County of North Carolina. Um, we are uh, dedicated partners with Charlotte Black Pride. We love Charlotte Black Pride and we love RAL. And uh, you know, we, we try as much as possible to partner with local um, nonprofits in the area as well and lift one another up because where our services end, somebody else's services begin. And so it really requires that interorganizational partnership to make sure that people don't fall through the gaps. We provide um, mental health services, uh, counseling, case management. And you know, the first thing that I'd like to say about these bills, you know, I've been on some of these emergency planning calls with a lot of the nonprofits in the ACLU and Quality NC. Rel, I actually don't know if you were on some of those calls or that you were. But the one thing that I want to say is there is no law, there is no perception, there is no opinion 
there is no context in the world that can invalidate someone's identity. It is a sacred thing. It is specific to each person. And there is literally nothing that I or anyone on this call or anyone out on the street can do to take that away from somebody. And so when we're talking about these legislative efforts, we need to call them what they are. It's a direct attack to try to invalidate someone's very existence, right? Because you can't change who a person is, but you can, you can make their lives exorbitantly more difficult. And that's what these bills seek to do. And you know, that's something that we've been trying to reiterate with the community that we recognize that these attacks are painful and they, they, they are, they are throwing a wrench into our very daily life, but never, never forget that nobody has the power to take away who you are. Um, you know, there are three bills that are out right now. We don't, you know, necessarily have to go into great detail, but just generally, um, House Bill 358 is a direct attack on trans youth uh, participating in sports, and that's youth leagues, high school, and intercollegiate. That bill was um, filed, I believe, on March 22nd, which was several, you know, about a week before the Trans Day of Visibility. It was also filed about a week before the fifth anniversary of what would have been HB2, which we're all familiar with. It made national headlines back in 2016. Senate Bill 514 was filed, and that is a direct attack on trans-affirming, gender-affirming, rather, health care for, for youth. Now, I say the word youth, and I want to make something, point something out about this bill, which is really odd, but the age stipulation that was included is 21 years old. So this bill is proposing to deny life-saving medical care, as we know it to be, to individuals up to the age of 21. And Kelly, to your point, I think legal experts are scrambling to even understand how that would be enforceable. Because how do you deny um, body autonomy to someone who is legally emancipated? It just, it doesn't even seem possible. That's how ludicrous some of these bills are. The other very detrimental thing about this bill is that it would have required reporting of healthcare providers, mental health care providers, um, educators to, you know, if they even suspect that someone's identity is incongruous with their assumed sex at birth, then there is required reporting to a guardian. And again, how do you enforce that with someone who doesn't have a legal guardian, someone over the age of 18? So it's very, it's very, uh, it's very broad, it's very detrimental, it's very devastating, you know, if this were to become law. Um, it would also deny mental health care that may be considered to be preparatory in advance of a procedure or GHHT. So it, it is comprehensive in terms of its devastation. And again, we are fighting it. You know, we are standing with organizations that would fight this in court if it made its way through the chambers and to a vote and so on and so forth. Um, we're not sure if it would, given, again, the, this ambiguity in some of the writing of it. But it is still devastating that someone would take the time to write such a heinous bill. Um, the third bill that had been filed in North Carolina is a discrimination based on religious or moral exemption bill, which would not only deny medical care for trans and gender expansive folks, this would include things like abortion. I mean, it is a very broad, broad reaching bill that would inevitably give any healthcare provider the right to deny or discriminate um, and deny medical care based on anything that they might consider a religious exemption. And I, you know, I wanna take a break there because I know this is really, really heavy stuff. And the reason I, I just wanted to kind of mention what these bills entail is because there are a lot of people who still don't don't know about them. It, th there are a lot of people both in our community and outside of it. And, and it's really important to raise awareness that, you know, even if these bills don't make it through, they were still filed. Somebody still took the time to think this up. And that is a major problem. Um, so, you know, to, in terms of your question, something that Transcend is doing is just really, you know, we're, we're trying to community organize as much as, much as possible, get the word out. Um, Equality NC, has made a great uh, landing page, ncisready.org, and it has a sort of automatic, um, you know, you plug in your zip code and it gives you the words to call your representatives with or to send the email. That's a resource we've been trying to share very heavily as well. And then also um, really creating safe space with our support groups and our other services for people to come decompress because this is heavy, it's hard, and we have to give ourselves grace and, you know, take time to process. This year for our town hall, I'm actually going to be talking about what we're discussing today, uh, bringing awareness to uh, the Charlotte community here 
about the bills um, and the focus is going to be primarily about our youth. Uh, typically last year we focused on kind of educating the community because it was the first time that they had anybody transgender on the board. So it was new for me. It was, it was, it was something I wasn't used to, but we went in to educate people on importance of pronouns, being respectful for people, you know, making sure you're not outing anybody, understanding what transgender is, understanding what gender neutral is, gender fluid, because you will be surprised. A lot of people, even in our LGBT community, didn't know um, what those terms mean. And even I learned things myself. So um, I think that helped a lot of our community kind of understand us more and realize, you know, we're no different than anyone else, minus a few differences, but we still live regular day-to-day -day lives like everyone else. And we would like to have the same respect and, you know, be, be looked at the same way. Um, so this year, I'm definitely excited. Um, like I said, the town hall is going to be focused on our youth because that is where our focus is right now. And we want to make sure that our transgender youth, 25, 21, 18, below, they have a voice and they have something that they can attend in person or online. They can bring their families if their families are having trouble adapting to their transfer to their uh, transition. Um, we want to gear it around family and making sure that our our younger transgender community understand that we're here and there's going to be one full day geared towards that. So that's the direction we're going in this year. That's that's absolutely amazing that all of this horrible stuff, instead of breaking a community, can make a community connect with one another and hold on to one another and build support and love for one another right in the middle of it. And one of the things I do want to talk about very quickly, because I think it's going to come up, is the idea you were talking about mandated reporting earlier, Bethany. The state of Tennessee a couple of years ago had a quote unquote mandated reporting gay bill. If your child shows any signs of possibly being, if a child shows signs of being gay, they've got to be reported and it was, luckily it was squashed but there's other things being introduced in the state. And the idea that gender, can, gender expression can be policed is so mind boggling. The, the fact that it's even someone up to 21 years of, old, of age can be oppressed as to who they are. But could you imagine some girl wearing flannel, not to point you out, Bethany, but flannel could be considered a gendered thing. And the next thing you know, you are reported to the gender police for wearing a flannel shirt. And that's the level of absurdity that they are trying to take these bills to, I feel like, in North Carolina is to just super duper enforce what the gender roles are for human beings. Mm -hmm. I was raised Southern Baptist Evangelical. I know very well that gender roles are strictly enforced in some faith-based communities, and that is fine. If you're a part of a faith-based community that has these very stringent gender roles, live by them. But you have to respect the fact that I might not conform to your gender roles and that you owe me that same level of respect. And I'm hoping that some of these even though it's hurting our community right now, I see it online all the time, how our community is angry, mm -hmm. it's frustrated, but it's also a community of top-notch human beings that are full of love and compassion. And we have this, I can only imagine the parents of these trans youth that these bills are going against right now, how organized they are becoming right now in their world without us even having any knowledge of it and how scared they must be at the same time. And the fact that you all offer these services to these people right in the middle of this, it's going to save lives. It just is. I think to piggyback off of what you said, I think, um, and I think I said this in another interview the other night, if if the people that are writing these bills would take a back seat and just, and I mean, it, it probably sounds crazy, but if you were to have all of your children line them up in front of you one at a time and say, you're not who I want you to be. You're not who I want you to be. 
I want you to be somebody else. I want you to be someone else. And just watch the reactions to their face. If you're talking to your child, how comfortable would that make you? So if you have other friends that are parents and they may possibly have a transgender child, even if you don't know, how would that affect you if someone said that to one of your friends about their child? You put yourself in that person's shoes. These are children. And you're basically telling them with these bills, you're not good enough as you are or as you want to be. But in the same breath to say our children are our future, what, what type of future are we giving them if we're telling them as a youth or as a child that you're not, you, you can't be who you want to be. You have to be what society says because they don't agree or because we're going to write a bill someone that know, doesn't know you has never seen you doesn't know how awesome you are how intelligent you are how smart you are the direction that you're going to college or the, whatever you're not good enough simply because of your gender and it, it it the reaction if you were to see the reaction to your child's face i think that would make a lot of people shift it because if you if if you can't if you can't accept the reaction from your child then that should make you to look at the big picture because that is someone's child and that respect has to be there and i it's hurtful because i'm thankful that i am 38 and i didn't have these situations but it's hurtful because i know so many that aren't that lucky that are you they still have a lot a long life to go they've got a long there's some of them just just starting some just beginning to know who they are and you a brick wall possibly we're hoping not but it's it's hurtful. It's hurtful because it is, it's, who are you to tell someone who they should be? Because no one told you who you should be. So what gives you that right? And then when you take a look at the, you know, the suicide rate and things like that for our transgender youth, is this supposed to help it? Their lives matter. Whether you understand it or respect it or have no idea what it even means, their lives matter. It's, it's completely nauseating. Well, I just, you're moving me to tears. I, you know, it, it's, to, to your point, when you, when you tell people to make it personal, you know, and, and then to see that shift and then, you know, you have to grapple with the fact that you didn't care unless, until this was about you. And I'll tell you, you know, something else, you know, Kelly, when you were talking about the mandated reporting and one of the reasons that is so wildly scary because, you know, right up until this moment, we've been talking about youth and kids who have parents. So when we start talking about the layered complexity of kids in the system, kids who live with guardians who aren't a direct parent, kids who live with others' families, kids who are literally couch surfing because of whatever reason. Um, you know, and we look at the rates of domestic violence, we look at the rates to, to, to Rel's point of depression and of suicide and the layered complexity when you start talking about kids' contextual situations as well as their layered identities then we know statistically the, 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 the youth and kids that this is most predominantly going to affect. And I'll tell you, it's not upper middle class white kids, right? It's gonna be kids of color. It's gonna be kids in transitional housing. It's gonna be kids who are affected and have low socioeconomic status, so on and so forth. And, and I think that that is something that is so, so powerful too, to just remember when, when anti anything legislation comes out, there are going to be groups of people who are more devastatingly affected than others. And that is just going to further the cycle of poverty and, you know, the generational gap wealth and all of the things that are, are that are, you know, our country, all of the things that make our systems so flawed. And so, you know, I, you know, I know we didn't, that's, I need to correct myself. They're not flawed. They were intentionally designed that way, right. To benefit others. Um, and, and, and that's something that just like really infuriates me too, because this mandated reporting will increase violence at 100%. It will increase rejection. It will increase homeless uh, houselessness. We're going to see, you know, I, I'm not calling this into being, if it were to pass, we would see in the states where it does pass, we would see um, an increase in houselessness for teens and for, for adolescents. And we just, we can't let it happen. We absolutely can't. We, um, I, as you, uh, I think I've told you, shared with y'all, I'm an educator by trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I work with middle schoolers, the age where all of the identities of a human being kind of mesh at once with 
testosterone or estrogen or puberty and all of the other wonderful things that happen during this point in their lives. And I had a student today, I was the first day in class with us, like it's a new brand new student, just came from a different school to us and was sitting there and I was waiting for the parent to come with this kid and we were just talking and every time a new kid comes into the school, the first thing I do is I introduce myself with my, all of my identities. I'm a disc golfer. I used to fight forest fires. I lived in England for three years. I happen to be transgender. I'm an educator. And the kid at the end of the day today was talking with me. She goes, I already love it here. And it's my first day because it's the most real place I've ever been in my life. And she said, as an example, when you said that you were transgender, the last school that I was at, if transgender topics were brought up, the teacher said that it was inappropriate to discuss them in school. And my first thought, and I said this to the child was, we, I will never allow anyone to make me feel taboo about my existence. I am not taboo. Mm -hmm. And to, to be able to impart that onto a middle schooler, these children that these anti-trans bills are going after, that you are not taboo even though this stuff is happening, we have to get that point across to them because that message they need to receive personally. And this child today started opening up about things in their life just because I said this one thing about like me being transgender was one of 20 parts of my identity. But it struck a resonance with this kid because all of those other identities of mine aren't taboo. I'm allowed to be a forest firefighter. I'm allowed to be an educator. I'm even allowed to be a professional disc golfer, as crazy as that sounds. But maybe I'm not allowed to be a transgender woman. Okay. And I just, I don't know how to keep, other than people meeting trans people that are positive role models to shatter the taboo impression and that's scary to do. Down in the South, I was stealth. I wasn't brave enough to be out like you are, Rel. No way was I brave enough to do that. Not even close. Because I was afraid of all of the socioeconomic impact of it, the hatred that was going to come mm -hmm. towards me. But those children, at the exact same time, they need to see me. They need to see you. So how are you all balancing having trans adults be mirrors for the community so people can see positive in us. You know, kind of going back to the very first thing I said when we started the call in terms of partnership and why we love Charlotte, you know, we, we love y'all anyway, right? But why we love Charlotte Black Pride, why we love Charlotte Pride, why we love Time Out Youth, there's another really phenomenal organization in Charlotte called the Gender Education Network. Um, and um, the Gender Education Network actually works with, you know, children and families up to age 10. Trans, or time Out Youth starts working with LGBTQ kids at 10, I, I believe, and, and they go up to 18 and then in some circumstances 21, 24, and then obviously we pick up at that adult range. And so it really is about partnership with these organizations, making sure that we can promote them where we can. Um, you know, the Gender Education Network, for example, that is their entire mission, is, is providing a safe space for parents and educational space, working with schools and, and other, you know, systems where kids might be present. I mean, I think for us, we, we try to do as much community education as possible when, when we become invited. Um, one kind of general thing that I'll say, um, you know, we do, we do have speakers, we do try to repost, we try to share as much self-learn information. And, and again, when I say self-learn, I'm, I'm talking about the, 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 the larger population and, and that includes a lot of ally community groups, friends, families, partners, so on and so forth. And one kind of side note thing that I'll say, and, and I wanna make sure that, well, Raul, you go ahead and circle back with your answer to this direct question, because I have something sort of circular to say. Okay. Um, the conversation. We, no problem. We do, um, we do speakers as well. Um, now that, of course, top priority is making sure that our community is you know, taken care of and making sure that we have all the resources, that sources that we need um, and making sure our events for our community are completed first or at least uh, almost completed before we, you know, step outside of the box for those type of events. But um, any type of situation or, you know, event that's going on or 
something that needs to be bringing awareness. We've got great people on our board that are not afraid to stand up and speak out. If 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 all of us are not available, there's going to at least be three members that are going to be present if there is a meeting or something that needs to be talked about. <clears throat> um, so it's 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 definitely important. Um, personally, for me, um, as you mentioned, Kelly, it this is probably the first year that I have been this much out um, simply because of everything that has been going on. Before now, um, I joined the Charlotte Black Pride Board uh, April of last year. So prior to that, um, I pretty much was stealth. Um, if you didn't know me prior to the last seven years, then you would have no idea. Um, but anyone that, you know, or you would know, but anyone after that point just knows real. They don't know anything else. Um, and that's because, you know, like you said, depending on where you are, who you're around, it, it can get troubling. Um, I'm fortunate I haven't had any um, negative situations, not nowhere near the horror stories that I've heard from some of my um, transgender friends. Um, so I'm thankful for that. But when I do hear these stories, it's like, you know, that easily could have been me, you know, just walking home, minding your business, somebody that does know and somebody that doesn't know and they cross paths and then it's a question or, you know, prior to having surgeries and things like that, it, it, the, the idea of walking out your front door and not knowing what the day is gonna bring. Um, the numerous murders that take place that we bring awareness to every year for Transgender Day of Remembrance, it's, it's those type of things we have one of those events every year. We team up with our different community um, leaders. We do one that may just be Charlotte Black Pride, but most of the time we're, we're, we're with everyone because it includes everyone. Um, and it's, a, it's an important topic that the transgender women of color in Charlotte and all surroundings, whether it's in the United States, it's international, they're being killed. They're being killed. And I don't say that lightly. Um, the numbers every year, unfortunately, are not decreasing. They're increasing. Um, I think last year when we did the, the, the ceremony, we did it online, there were seven pages that we read. I divided, I was in charge of reading the names. There were seven pages of names to be read. That was the longest portion of our event was simply reading the names of those individuals that had been murdered. And it, it's those type of things that these bills are, could, if they go into effect, it could possibly increase it. It's going to increase the amount of violence because it, you're, you're basically giving people that agree the okay to react how you would feel like you would react to this person because you don't agree with their lifestyle choice or their, the lifestyle that they were born into. I won't say it's a choice because I wasn't, I didn't choose to be this. I didn't choose to be me. I am me. And it, these, these, these type of things are, are what we're not afraid to have the discussion. Um, we're not afraid to bring it to the table to those people that don't want to hear it. It's there um, because we, we've got to keep pushing it whether people want to hear it or not. And if we try to sweep it under the table and pretend that these things and these things, these things don't exist and these laws aren't trying to be passed, it's not going to just affect the transgender community. I think that's what everyone needs to realize. It's a domino effect. It's going to affect everyone. And, and yeah, that is so perfect because, you know, there, with disability comes greater risk, right? And the greater need for protection. And, and I'm not just talking about individuals um, and their outward gender expression and, you know, at the point where, where they come out to the world. I mean, I'm talking about nationally. So we're talking about these individual bills in North Carolina, but just to put this in perspective, you know, for, for your audience, Kelly, in 2020, there were, you know, around 40 something anti-trans bills that were put forward, you know, devastating legislature. And then at the end of the year in, in November, we had a record, win, a landfall win comparatively, a ceiling shadow win for uh, trans and gender expansive folks taking office at the civic level, at the state level, national level. It was, an, you know, a, a landmark year. And then let's move to 2021. In the first two and a half months, almost immediately following those elections, just the first two and a half months of 2021 alone, 
the cumulative number of anti-trans bills that have been put forward nationally are more than double the 2020 cumulative uh, number total, right? We have so far in only two and a half months, 84, and, and, and my count might be off at this point. It might even be upwards of, of 90. Um, and that's nationally. And the reason I bring that up is not because I feel like that indicates a loss of progress. I think the louder you are, the more present you are, that's when you're gonna to start to see resistance. And we have to be prepared for it. You have to be prepared for that backlash. And to kind of, you know, what, what Rel was saying is so, so important because, you know, to your question, Kelly, around having role models, having people who are out and in the public eye, we really struggle with that. We really struggle a, finding individuals who feel like they are personally ready, but then finding individuals as an organization that we kind of take a look at the context and say, we are comfortable putting you in that position. It's much easier to make individual introductions to have that community support and support group and so on and so forth. Um, you know, at, at Transcend, we get dozens of requests for interviews a week. I mean, Kelly, even for this interview, I asked four people um, and, and, and everybody said, you know what, I'm not comfortable. It's not safe right now. And we not only respect that, sometimes we don't ask people because we don't want to put them in that risky position. And, and that's where, you know, having that wisdom and that informed consent, you know, idea comes in because sometimes people are ready in their heart, but they don't understand the community backlash that could happen. And we are unwilling to put people at risk. Um, and and it, it really is a balance. And especially when it comes to kids, the heinous thing about this bill is that, you know, when you go to testify against something like that, you know, you see the videos on, uh, C-SPAN and so forth when, you know, at the national level people go before, uh, you know, Congress and they're testifying, right? And you see families and parents and kids. I mean, those people are literally risking their lives and it, it grieves me to think someone would have to make that decision. You know, nobody is lesser than because they are not ready to be in a public facing position. Nobody is lesser than because they don't want to take on that kind of risk. And that's where, that's where allyship comes in. That's where, you know, organizational organizing comes in because there needs to be that that protective wall you know we are standing with you people are at the front you are not the only one um, speaking you know and and i and we always tell ally groups don't speak on someone else's behalf but don't let them be the only person standing out there you know on the streets picketing that is that is not how allyship works you don't say well this problem doesn't affect me so i won't raise my voice but at the same time, you don't go snatching the megaphone away from people saying, I am appropriating your pain. And, and I think that, that you know, that's something that people have immediate like defense triggers against. They think, well, you, know, you just don't want me here. And it's like, no, you have a responsibility. You have a right. You are, your privilege is contributing to the existence of the systems that are oppressing these people. Go tear down the wall, right? But don't, you know, so, so it is, it's, it's complicated for sure. And, um, and we definitely have that call of action out to the community. No, you know, please do not put the responsibility of opposing these bills on the backs of the people who are being marginalized and discriminated because of it. Call your representatives, say that it's heinous, say that it is an anti-human bill. It's not just an anti-trans bill. It's not just a gender inequality bill. It is an anti-person bill. And, and, and you know, that's, that's a hard one because, um, that's a hard one. We, you know, we will never put someone at risk. We will never um, invalidate someone's reason for being stealth, but, you know, I, I, we do have to speak up, so. I, I know that one personally. Like I said, for 10 years in Tennessee, mm -hmm. I didn't tell a soul. Like I went and did my job. I went and did everything. My, my best friends, I didn't tell anyone. And I give myself a lot of respect for understanding that that was where I was at in my life and that's what I needed to do to make sure that I'm now able to be here in front of a camera and be this person that is far more comfortable now than I was down then. But I had to allow that part of me to exist for this to happen. So I agree with you, nobody should ever feel obligated to have to go out themselves. Yeah. I waited. Um... I started my process at 32. Um, I always knew, but I'm super close to all of my family. My biggest thing was I never wanted my decisions or my life to possibly impact or you know cause any harm to anyone in my immediate circle or my family. So if that meant me continuing to be pre-transition, then I, I was willing to do that. Um, 
I can't imagine for for you know those younger than that to feel like they have to wait until whenever to be you. Um, and my purpose of waiting was simply because of my family. I can't imagine having feeling like I have to wait because the law, the law has made it clear that I can't be me. And if I decide to be me, there are a lot of repercussions to follow, not just for me, but for my doctor that I may have gotten to know and now they can't help me. My surgeries, I can't have them. My medication that I need to, to start, I can't get it. I'm stuck in this box and I don't feel comfortable. I can't be me. I don't know what to do. It, I, I can't imagine being in that place. So um, last year when I decided to join the board, I, I felt like, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm blessed to not have those stories. So if 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 there's anything that that I can do to bring awareness or to help someone that isn't comfortable being themselves or being completely out, then that's what I'll do because I've been fortunate to be here for 30 years, 38 years and be me. Everyone doesn't have that story. And I think if a lot of us that have do have the, you know, don't have the, the horror stories that we hear, if we all step up. Because, and, I, and I'll say this clearly, and I've said it a lot, of, a lot of times, I know that there are a lot of transgender males in Charlotte. I realize that it can be uncomfortable, depending on your employer, depending on your family, depending on your friends, depending on your neighbors, depending on the school that your children go to. It, it, it can get bad. If you're in those situations, I completely understand because we, we're, we're here to live and, and you want to be comfortable and make sure those around you are comfortable. But if you have even a slight opportunity to shed a little bit of light, to share your story where it may help, even if it's just one person to feel more comfortable being this, themselves, we all have to, we all have to do our part. Um, so that's why this year I've, I've, I've stepped out full throttle. Um, I spoke to my family about it. I wanted them to know that, you know, I don't know what will come from this, but I know who is in charge of my life. And I know that this could possibly help someone else to say, hey, I had no idea. Even it actually happened the other day on Instagram. Um, there was a guy that commented and said, I didn't even know that there were the trans guys in Charlotte. I felt so alone on Trans Day of Visibility. And I messaged him back. You know, at least one guy now, <laughs> instant message me. I've never met you, never heard of you a day in my life, but it's that small step that can help not just one person, but that can help someone else. And if we all do our part, if you're in a comfortable and safe situation, if you're not, by all means, like Kelly and Bethany said, everyone's story is different. If it's not safe, please, it's, it's fine. But if you do have that option, you gotta exercise it because we, we there's work to be done and you know along with our allies we need our community too absolutely and you brought up the trans day of visibility and i felt like this year it was even more important for me to be visible than ever before and i think it's important like you said earlier the reason there's 84 bills being enacted is because there was so much positive movement in our community that they didn't know how to react <laughs> from us being like, here we are, we're good people. If we can actually hold political office and we can do things. Mm -hmm. And that trans day of visibility just seemed like I couldn't wait to out myself this year, it felt like. You know, and the other thing about that date, right, so March 31st, and I, I do want to make sure, that, you know, along with the idea of the trans day of visibility that we don't, you know, I feel like these attacks, the, 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 they're so nefarious because they steal our, 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 our time, right? Our mental time, our energies, our, our discussion time, you know, and I, it angers me because we have to talk about it. We have to raise awareness, but then it's like, what time does that leave us to talk about the, the victorious, the celebratory, the, the, the life, the joy? And one thing that I wanted to bring up while we're talking about legislation is that the day before TDOV this year, 
um, there were four pro LGBTQ equality legislation or you know bills that were filed, and those you know we're feeling very hopeful about them. There's great support for those in the General Assembly. Um, the Equality for All Act, the full repeal of the HB2, uh, Mental Health Protection Act, and then the prohibition of defense based on um, sex or gender, which is crazy that we need that legislation in place. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that a common defense, which has held up in court multiple times, to just out, outright violence or even murder against trans or gender expansive folks or, or, or you know, others in the LGBTQ community, um, that has held up four defendants in court and has gotten them out of jail time or, or worse, has been, oh, this information was sprung on me, I temporarily lost my mind, and I lashed out in violence, or I shot somebody, or I stabbed somebody, or whatever. And that defense has actually held up in court. And, and this particular bill is wonderful because it would prevent that future defense. It's asinine that we need it, but it's, it's, it's a huge win that it has been filed and that there is great support that is being gained for it. This has been passed in other states. So I just wanted to take a moment to, to, to applaud the individuals who um, you know, have put the forethought into creating these bills and they are gaining traction. And, and that is a win for us, much like the landmark wins for us in terms of representation nationally, right, back in, in 2020. So, you know, Kelly, just to your point and to reiterate, it's like every time you get a win, you have to be prepared because people aren't going to like it. But the silver lining of the, in that is that it means we had a win. And it means that, you know, people feel the need to kind of come at you, but that means that you're stronger and that the next time it'll be a bigger win and a smaller, you know, opposition or st smaller strength in opposition. Oh, absolutely. And just the, um, we're learning so much about how the political process works and how to approach it as the LGBTQIA yes. community as well. And unfortunately, it is a lot of times in response to things, but it does sound like some proactive things are happening in North Carolina also, and some proactive things happened in Tennessee. I know the attorney general down there said that, yes, going after transgender people is a hate crime in Tennessee. So those positive things are happening, and they will continue to happen because our community is organized. I couldn't imagine if there was a trans in Charlotte when I was 25 years old, when I first came out and I freaked out and detransitioned because I didn't know how to go forward after all of this family and all of the other things happened. Had there been a trans in Charlotte there for me or, you know, one of these organizations that are now existing, Absolutely. I'm perfectly happy with where I'm at in life now. But boy, howdy, I think I would have transitioned when I was 26 instead of when I was 40 at the same time. So I really think that what you all are doing truly is going to have an impact far into the future beyond us. And we're so grateful that you all are out there doing it. And thank you. I'm glad to be in the position to do it. Um because at some point someone had to do it for us, whether it, it, it had all of the media coverage and things like that, someone um, opened those doors for us. And like you said, you know, it has to be done in order to protect not just our rights, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. Um, I would hope this wouldn't still be a topic, but if we can move it, if we can move forward and, and, and create a lot more uh, protection laws I think that will help us, you know, in our, you know, future generations to come because despite what these leaders may think, these laws are not going to stop trans people from existing. We're not leaving. We're still going to be here and we're still going to be fighting and we're still going to be smiling all the way through. The tricky part to that is in some instances, you may not even know that we're in the same room with you why are you saying these things about us? And there may be some that are able to let it roll completely off, but you really don't know if we don't tell you. So a lot of times, I think, you know, some of these politicians and leaders and things like that should be mindful because your 
best friend or your next door neighbor or your, you know, favorite bartender very well could be transgender. So you, 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 you know, we're, we're not all under, <laughs> we're not all in one neighborhood, all huddled together. We're everywhere and we're not going anywhere. So, you know, you're just going to have to learn to learn to love us. We're awesome. I promise. If you ever meet a transgender person, I promise you, we're not, you're not we're nothing to be afraid of. I don't, I don't know why it's, it, it's, it just, it just baffles me because it's, we're in 2021 and you would think by now there's so many other things that we, we should be focusing on to bring each other together in 2021 after COVID and everything like that, but this is their focus above everything else. And uh, it's interesting you were saying that. I was listening to uh, NPR today and they were talking about, they had a historian on that was discussing the transgender community and how like people kind of have this perception that this is new, that we haven't always been around. And it was discussing some historical facts about like in Wisconsin, way back in the 50s, a little trans girl said, I'm a trans girl, listen to me. And her parents said, we listen to you. And they went to the school and they said to the school, hey, my kid is a trans girl, listen to her. And the school listened to them. And this little kids, all of their documentation and everything was changed to mask their gender identity. And this was in the 50s. So you're right, we, 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 we aren't going anywhere. We're gonna to continue to be born and we're gonna to continue to do good in the world and we're going to be human like every other human. You know, Kelly, that's a really, really great point. Um, and, and just something to kind of reiterate, you know, to, to anyone who's watching this. These bills are not fit based in medical fact. They're not based in any kind of valid historical representation. They're not based in any type of best practice. You know, they are made in a vacuum by individuals who don't understand and have maybe a specific objective in mind that is not beneficial to the community and really to anybody, right? Because this sets a precedent in equality that affects everybody negatively. Um, and, you know, there are, there's so much great literature out there. And, you know, something when I tell people, if you're on social media, there are some really phenomenal uh, influencers who, who um, a, a lot men and, you know, people who, who do these book digests and they, there's so much great, um, uh, uh, C. C. Riley Snorton. Um, no, did I, did I say his name correctly? Um, but the, anyway, there, there are just really, really phenomenal researchers who have done the work for us in this area in terms of um, researching the history, researching the uh, economic, socio-cultural, historic connotations of, of why these, these gendered, you know, opposition and oppression exist, right? What, you know, and, and, and the, you know, the fact that a lot of these things are within the past century, right? These aren't even centuries old problems because we know that the gender binary is theoretically new in terms of, in terms of history and we know why it was developed and so on and so forth. So um, I'm, I so apologize if I um, have, have butchered somebody's um, name, but I just encourage everyone to, um, you know, get out there and research and find uh, you know, this literature, find these academic, academicians, um, and, and learn because it's fascinating. It's fascinating and it will just crack your brain open, you know, when you realize, oh, this is very new and it was created for a reason. And I fell at the gender binary. <laughs> if it was a test, I would get an F. I, I don't do any of it. I mean, which is really interesting because as a transgender woman, I'm a very binary individual. I mean, like I consider myself very female, but as far as the gender roles that I was raised in, I would be considered a hot mess because I like sports, but I wanted to wear nail polish while I was playing sports. I liked skateboarding, but boy howdy, I would have liked to have had a skirt on while I was doing it. And I would have liked to have cooked but then I would have wanted to have gone out and worked on the car afterwards. And all of these expressions that are denied a human being based just simply on this made up concept of gender binary and gender roles, which unfortunately I bought into. 
or fortunately, I mean, I don't know whether what way to look at it at this point, but I did buy into the binary and I started thinking, oh, if I'm a trans woman, then I must, these must be the things about me because these are the things that represent every woman that's ever been created in the history of humankind ever. So I have to fit those specifications. And I failed at it, of course, because that person doesn't exist. And it's hard to break that binary down. It really is. And I feel that organizations like your all's that allow people to come in and challenge us. You had said that something about go learn. I am learning so much about our community by meeting our community myself. In real, I, I can't imagine in Charlotte, the amount of diversity that gets to come be part of such a large city because I mean, I know that, well, Charlotte is a pretty liberal city in the middle of the South. And so can you describe some of the diversity that you get to experience being in Charlotte, just so people can see this beautiful picture? To define it would be without words. We're every spectrum of the rainbow that you can possibly imagine. Um, all genders, whether you're transgender, non-binary, gender fluid, heterosexual, whatever, we're all inclusive. And I think, I think that's one of the things that I love. I'm born and raised in Charlotte. That's one of the things that I love about Charlotte. Um, I do realize that things do change. Some people still want things to be how they were in the past. Um, but as far as diversity, any events that we have are for everyone. Um, we, we make sure that that's listed on any information that we put out on social media. We make sure that that's if information is available at the door. We, we try to make sure that when you come to one of our events, you see someone that may look like you and you feel at home because you, people want to feel welcome. And it there's no way possible that, that you know, our city can continue to move forward with these type of laws. It's gonna cause us to take 20 steps backwards and it's basically tossing all of the hard work that all of our community has done for so many years to get us where we are. These things are gonna change the dynamics of that. And you know, a lot of those people that, that originally took those steps may or may not be here anymore, but they worked hard. They, they risked their lives you know, for us all to feel equal and for us all to feel included and all to feel welcome. So we, we're doing everything we can to make sure that that doesn't change, regardless of what laws may be passed. Our focus is gonna to continue to be diversity and everyone will be welcome and that's just the way it's gonna be. Um, and I hope, you know, I'm, I know all of the organizations that we work with here, Transcend, um, as you mentioned, Time Out Youth Gender Education Network, um, that's diversity. That is diversity, and that's why we made sure that we team together for Trans Day of Visibility, Trans Day of Remembrance. Um, you see everyone when you, you know, last year, like I said, we, we did pretty much everything online. I think everyone being able to log in and say, hey, you know, I see some of every, everyone that I could possibly think of, every race, every nationality, every gender, is all working together on this one event to make sure that our day is our day. And we're here for each other, regardless of what that looks like. And we're gonna to continue to do that. And I think that's what's gonna to continue to allow us the freedom that we have now and to keep it going forward for the generations to come. I agree 100%. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that the progress in our community, the, it, they, it, the attempt will be made to stop the progress, absolutely. And there will be some of these laws that go through, like in Arkansas, that does do some damage to our community. But I think the inevitable arc will bend towards justice, you know? It just, it will. And it's because, like you said, Rel, I think it's important to acknowledge that there were a ton of people before us that have been laying this groundwork to make it possible to where I can sit here in Acton, Massachusetts, 
talking about transgender issues with people in Charlotte, North Carolina, without it being a, a inappropriate or Jerry Springer type episode or whatever, you know, it's just people talking about here's what's going on in our lives, in our community, here's what we're trying to do to help our community, here's some of the impact it's having on us. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to sit down with you all today and discuss the impact that you all are having in your communities. I mean, my goodness, Transcend Charlotte, counseling services, clothing assistance, a fashionista on your part to help these people. <laughs> Real, you're like totally inclusive of this entire community. You're out there putting yourself front and center at a time when we desperately need for people to be front and center. And I can't think of a more righteous thing to do in life than to go do good for others. And you all are accomplishing that and it shows. So thank you. People go check out uh, Transcend Charlotte and Charlotte Black Pride. They both have websites. They both are doing fantastic things. And if you feel the urge to donate some money to some organizations that are out there doing good, they are both nonprofits, so I'm sure that they have an entire funding system set up on their website so where you all can help these wonderful organizations. Thank you all so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure meet, seeing you guys again. Can't wait to see you guys next week. Safe travels. And again, for everyone watching, take the time, like Bethany said, the material is there to educate yourselves. So the excuse to say you don't know anything about transgender or our rights or why it's important, if you can be on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Shade Room and all of those things, take five minutes out of your day and do a little bit of research and you will be surprised how it will change your view because we're not going anywhere. So you're going to have to learn to love us the same way we love and respect you. That's all we ask.